Um, my name is Clay Eastwood. Dr. Sable will, will, will be after me. Um, I'm going to kick off the implant portion of the audit by talking about transportation, um, mobility, and the harvest floor assessment. So first and foremost, collecting data of this magnitude would certainly not have been possible without all of our collaborating institutions. So thanks to all of those guys that helped us get this done. So for the transportation, mobility, and harvest floor assessments, we collected data at 17 um, beef packers across the United States. And if you just kind of glance at this, you'll see that um, we tried to capture a good representation of the fed steer and heifer industry across the U.S. As far as the different types of data that we collected, um, for the first time as a part of this portion of the audit, we collected data in regard to transportation and mobility characteristics. So it's a new feature of the audit and some good information that we have from that. We also collected information on animal ID method, hide color, branding, presence of mud and manure on the hide, presence of cattle horns, carcass bruising, and then condemnations and dentition characteristics. As far as how we collected some of this data, on the transportation and mobility data, transportation specifically, we um, collected data on 10% of trucks arriving at the facility um, on the day that we were there. And from those 10% of trucks that we sampled, we looked at cattle mobility on 100% of those cattle coming off the trucks as they exited the truck and then moved towards a scale or a holding pen. Um, the rest of these we collected on the harvest floor and collected about 50% of the day's production that we were there. So as I mentioned, the transportation and mobility data is a new feature of the audit. Um, and here's just some of the big findings that we found. Um, cattle were in transit to the packing facility for just over two and a half hours um, on average. But as you can see here, it ranged um, from being very close to the packing facility to coming from great distances and traveling on those trailers for long periods of time. Um, along with that, so um, distance traveled averaged about 135 miles. But again, some of those cattle were coming from very close to the packing facility. Um, and some were coming from very great distances. We saw that about, um, on average, there were about 36 head on those uh, cattle trailers arriving at the facility. And then we also looked at trailer dimensions. Um, most of those trailers arriving at these fed cattle plants were potbelly style trailers, so no surprise there. But um, also interesting here, we looked at the area allotted per animal um, on those trailers, and we found that on average, those animals were receiving just over 12 square feet on those trailers. And so there's a small box up there, and I know it's probably a little bit difficult for you guys to see, um, but one of the things that we found is based on recommended animal handling guidelines, um, for a 1,000-pound hornless animal, um, they require at least 12 square feet um, on that trailer. So if we look at the average of just over 12 square feet, um, we know that cattle are getting larger, and so that with increasing live cattle size, um, we probably need a little bit more room there on those trailers or fewer cattle on the trailers to accommodate that size. For mobility, this is the scale that we used as outlined by the North American Meat Institute. Um, so we said that animals arriving with normal mobility would be scored a number one, and then as mobility declined or got worse, um, those animals would be categorized as a number four. And those animals were extremely reluctant to move, even when encouraged or were statue-like. So, Again, this is a new feature of the audit, and I believe this information tells a really positive story for the beef industry. So we found that um, almost 97% of cattle arriving at the packing plants where we surveyed um, had normal mobility. 3% um, had a mobility score of a number two, 0.1% um, mobility score of number three, and then 0% mobility score number four. Um, and then as far as downers, that zero is truly a zero. Um, of the cattle we surveyed, there were zero downers. Um, that we saw. As far as cattle with identification, we found that 95.6% of cattle surveyed on the harvest floor had some form of identification, whether that be a lot tag, an EID tag, um, a metal clip, just some form of identification, which is down just a little bit from the 2011 audit. We also noticed that in terms of number of forms of identification, um, about 60% of animals had at least one form of identification. About 22% had two forms, 11.5% three forms, and then 1.5% of cattle had four forms of ID, and then um, a very small percentage had five forms of identification. 
Looking at hide color, so we assessed predominant hide color or apparent breed type, um, and what we found was that about 58% of cattle um, had a predominant hide color of black, probably to no surprise. 20% um, of cattle had a Holstein apparent breed type, 11% were red, and then it kind of trails off from there. So compared to the 2011 audit, um, predominantly black hided cattle decreased by about three percentage points, and Holstein cattle, or apparent breed type, um, actually increased from about five and a half percent in the 2011 audit. And so some of the reasons for this may have just been, you know, market conditions leading up to this, and um, the cattle that we surveyed over 2016. Um, but also we surveyed, like I mentioned, we surveyed 17 plants throughout the year last year um, and tried to pick up a wider variety of plants throughout the U.S. Looking at the presence of cattle horns, um, we found that just over 83% of cattle surveyed did not have horns, whereas 16.7% 16, 16 did not have, or had horns, excuse me. And so we saw the number of cattle with no horns um, increase from 2011. And of those cattle that did have horns, um, about 5.5% were categorized as less than an inch. 8.3% um, had horns 1 to 5 inches in length. And then just under 3% had horns that were greater than 5 inches in length. Switching to carcass bruising, um, we found in 2016 that just over 61% of cattle surveyed um, did not have a bruise. And so this is down quite a bit from the 2011 audit. And then in terms of, you know, sometimes we see carcasses with multiple bruises on a single animal. And so we found that 28% um, of those carcasses had a bruise or a single bruise. Um, just over 8% had two bruises. Uh, just over 2% had three bruises. And then it declined pretty drastically there for four and greater than four bruises. So bruise location, so we categorized where those bruises were located on the carcass. So of those carcasses with a bruise, um, about 30% were located on the loin area, 27.8% were located on the round, 16.5% um, were located on the chuck area, just under 15% on the rib, and the remaining just under 12% were located on the brisket plate or the flank area of that carcass. And so from there, even though we saw more carcass bruising in the 2016 data, I guess kind of the silver lining or the good portion of this is that 77% of the cattle, um, we categorize their bruise severity as minimal. And so you see down at the bottom there, we have the, the scale or the reference that we utilize to categorize these bruises. And so we said that minimal would, be, um, would result in less than a pound of surface trim loss. Um, a major bruise would be one to 10 pounds of surface trim loss. A critical bruise greater than 10 pounds. And an extreme bruise would be loss of the entire primal. So again, even though we saw greater carcass bruising in the 2016 audit, 77% um, of those were categorized as minimal. Um, just over 20% were categorized as major, 1.7% critical, and then under 1% were those extreme bruises where the entire primal would be lost. Off all condemnations, um, so we have here liver, lungs, visceras, heads and tongues, um, where we assess 50% of those carcasses and heads and tongues coming through. Um, we see here over time um, that we've had a greater percentage of um, liver, lung, and viscera off-all condemnations, um, and that's increased from the 2005 audit, um, has increased steadily over time. Um, and you see there especially that those liver condemnations have really taken off since 2011. But the good news is, is we have fewer head and tongue condemnations um, over time, and those have really decreased. So looking at specific reasons for the liver and lung condemnations, we see that the biggest reason livers get condemned um, on the viscera table is a result of liver abscess, whether that be a minor abscess or a major abscess on the liver. That is the greatest reason for um, liver condemnations. That is followed by liver contam contamination at about 10%, and then liver flukes um, just over 1% for condemnations. Lungs were primarily condemned for contamination, um, but also pneumonia, and we had varying degrees of um, pneumonia that we looked at. So some of the big key trends that we observed on um, the harvest floor assessment, we saw fewer cattle with identification, um, fewer black hided cattle, and more Holstein cattle in this audit, more cattle without a brand or horns, fewer carcasses without bruising, or essentially, in other words, more carcass bruising, 
um, more liver, lung, and viscera condemnations, and fewer head and tongue condemnations. One other part I didn't mention earlier on, um, a new kind of key feature to the 2016 audit, is we looked at whether or not um, slaughter cattle or carcasses were actually dragging the floor or equipment um, throughout the packing plant. And this kind of came about because we know that packers have had to accommodate larger, larger cattle and larger carcasses coming through their kill floors. And so we just wanted to kind of get a baseline and a benchmark for how those packers were accommodating that larger size. And what we found was that 6.3% of all cattle surveyed were actually dragging or touching some form of equipment throughout the kill floor. So that was um, another interesting part of this audit. And with that, Dr. Sable, it's actually your turn now. Thank you, Clay. Uh, I'm going to move into the uh, implant carcass assessment. And the part that I'll talk about, I'm going to talk about kind of two areas. One's the implant carcass assessment and also the uh, camera information, instrument grading information that we had that, uh, that we uh, looked at. So here's a list of the plants that we uh, went to for the implant uh, carcass assessment. So uh, that's kind of the, uh, basically all of them. So it's uh, all around the country and you can kind of see uh, where we've been and where we went there. Uh, in this case, we looked at 10% at, uh, of the carcasses per day and our attempt was to have 10% of a lot so however the lot came in, so if you had 200 head in a lot, you would get 20 of the carcasses there. If you had, you know, 50 head lot, that's five and things like that. So, you know, if you think somewhere in there, that 10%, that kind of gets you up into that 90,000 head per day category, which is probably about right on fed cattle. And so that, that gives you an idea of where we, we were. Uh, in this case, the data were collected from January of 2016 to December of 2016. We worked with USDA and the Agriculture Marketing Service and had grading supervisors that actually called out anything that would need to, to have an official um, a grade associated with it. So marbling score, maturity, uh, kidney and pelvic uh, heart fat, those kinds of things like that. Anything else we could measure, we would measure from that standpoint. So everything we have is an official USDA grade from that standpoint. And so I want to give a, a, a big thank you to uh, USDA for providing uh, the folks, and they were great to work with, and we've done that for a number of years. But it really is helpful to have them in the plant and being able to collect this uh, information. This is just kind of a couple of things that we observe. So the research teams being the, in the plant, being the cooler, would be going along here collecting data. So on the data sheets, there are a lot of places that we could write down information. One of the things we did in there is also to include things like G programs. And so if they had a various schedule that they're working with USDA as far as a program like a certified Angus beef type, um, example so you would have uh, that and we would uh, capture that information. So there were 20% uh, of the cattle, so one out of five carcasses coming down the line would uh, have been in part of a G schedule program. In house grade, uh, we had 7.5%. Uh, those that were qualified or something, some kind of natural program, 1.4%. And we ran into a very, very small number of grass-fed that uh, were in here, about 0.2%. Now, when you break that G program out, and we've not had a chance to kind of talk to any of the program uh, people. I know we've got several people here from Certified Angus. We haven't gone back and compared our numbers to some of their statistics. And that would be interesting to kind of hear from them and get their reaction. These were the top programs we found that were the G programs. And so 7.9% then were certified Angus beef. Um, National beef uh, had two programs that were involved in this. The um, black Angus, uh, Canyon Angus beef, that was 2.6%. Uh, then you see all the way over to the right, then 1.7 in their premium reserve program. Then Swift premium black Angus was 2.1%. All the other... Uh, G programs, G schedules that we saw uh, added up to about 5.9%. So again, most time when we go into a plant, almost everybody had kind of two programs there. So they would have like a CAB program and then they'd have their own program. And a lot of times their own program might be something else that might not fit from a weight standpoint. 
um, a, um, you know, some other characteristic that they might have. And so uh, that was kind of one of the things that we noticed on this. Our estimated breed type that we did, so research teams would look at the carcasses and try to determine if they thought they were native, if they thought they were balsenicus. So balsenicus would have a hump that would at least be about four inches uh, in height, and then or if it had dairy uh, conformation, and that's kind of how we did that. So you just, just a visual assessment of what the carcasses look like to kind of put them in these categories. And this matches up with what Clay told you earlier, you know, we don't have the same plant, so it's not a, a true apples to apples comparison for where we went from, uh, from all of the plants we, that we evaluated. But when you look at this, you can see there that in, in the 2016, we had 15.9% of them that would have been of the dairy type. And so we've drew a line, you kind of notice on this, and you go back to the uh, 2000 audit with about, uh, Two or uh, nearly 7% of the carcasses that would have been classified as dairy type, then up to almost 16%. And so we just kind of drew that line that that, that number has increased. If you look at that also, the balsenicus type, those that would have a, you know, a apparent uh, balsenicus kind of breed, has kind of precipitously dropped off too over time. And so I think that's probably reflective of some of the breeding programs or some of the things where crossbreeding where you probably have de emphasize. Uh, some of the high percentage cattle uh, over over time. So it's kind of interesting to kind of look at that, just kind of see how how those kind of shake out. It probably shouldn't, uh, it's, uh, you didn't come here to learn that carcasses are heavier today. You already knew that. But I think it's interesting to take a look at this, at this um, uh, chart here to kind of look at this. I com uh, commented yesterday when we were looking back at the slide and I said, we've got this old dragon tail over here, over here uh, to the left of these carcasses. There's just not very many in them. But when you look at those numbers, those are the six weight carcasses. And it's amazing that we're out here at this point, you know, in 2017 at this, and looking at the minority and the very few six weight carcasses. And in my lifetime, those were kind of the standards when we got kind of started at this. And so, uh, you know, if you took those off, we could truly get back to our bell-shaped curve. The average carcass weight is 860 pounds, and again, uh, early in my career, that was kind of a monster, and so again, that's our average at that point. But it also tells you that we've got uh, carcasses, we've got, um, you know, the bell-shaped curve on either side of that, so that also tells you if we're averaging 860, that uh, usually we're going to end up having a uh, 200 pound range on either side of that that's going to kind of capture uh, kind of 95% of the carcasses. So it's not uncommon to find some uh, very large ones there. I don't remember right now, uh, Clay could probably remind me on that. I know that we did find some 11 and 1200 pound carcasses in the plants. And so every once in a while, those of you that are familiar, those of you that go collect data and see that, it's not uncommon to see some uh, very, very large carcasses that do show up uh, in that. And then again, this is just a chart just kind of showing the increasing in hot carcass weight over time. And uh, just as we've gone from 1991 up into 2016, I won't predict the future. I don't know what will happen in five years from now, but if I had to predict it based on that, they'll just keep getting larger and larger on that. Now, this is a chart that we've had in uh, previous rollouts of the quality audit, just kind of taking a look at, well, you know, if you had prime and choice and select carcasses, is kind of what are their characteristics. And so this just shows you kind of like the fat thickness for uh, prime is about 63 hundredths and choice 59 hundredths and select uh, 47 hundredths of an inch. Ribeye area goes the opposite direction. So the ribeyes and select carcasses are uh, larger than what they are for choice or for the prime. Carcass weights are actually higher for the prime, probably uh, goes uh, without saying when we think about those having more finish on them. And then the yield grade obviously is a little bit higher for the prime compared to choice and compared to select. So the nice thing about the data set we have, you can kind of look at it in any way you want to. And I was thinking about it today, Clay was looking back at something. You know, when we started this in 1991, you know, we were still using mainframe computers to analyze all this stuff. And, you know, if you want to ask her something, she can go over here on her laptop and get you an answer pretty quick on that. So there's been a lot of changes, not only in the cattle, but in our ability to be able to mine data on a, on a moment's notice. 
Uh, the number of carcasses that graded kind of at least prime choice or select or those that would fit you know, today's market, uh, that number is good, 94.3%. Uh, so very few outliers in that, and I think that's great news for the beef industry. And if you look at uh, the number of choice and prime over time, if you notice in this that uh, we've seen this uptake, and uh, of course I know this past year, even past spring, we were doing a project where we needed to get some select beef, and we were working with an uh, end user product. He said, you know, the problem right now, because there's so little select beef being produced, we're buying product that is in a box that says select or hire, and we're pulling out choice product out of it. Now, I know that that kind of comes and goes and such, but, uh, you know, we've seen some very high percentages of choice uh, grading back during this year, and we obviously saw it back during this past year. And so I think that's good news that we're seeing more that fit the market from a higher end and fewer that don't fit, and so that's great news for the industry. We've also seen this over in the prime grade, and so, again, during this past year, we had 3.8% of the carcasses that fit in prime. I will tell you, the Holstein cattle uh, helped that number. And so you, that's not a surprise to anyone on that. So uh, that, that would be one of the benefits that you would have from that. The fat thickness, um, they were probably a little bit fatter than what we've seen. But again, that's the reflection of probably the size and probably from a relative standpoint uh, from, that, from that deal. And again, market conditions and things like that can have an impact on that. And then the yield grade, the other thing we talked about said, you know, we're probably going to be always around a yield grade three. You know, it's going to be a two nine, three, three one, something like that. Because again, as the carcasses get heavier, that becomes something that detracts from yield grade. But if they get more muscular, then that kind of help offsets that. And so somewhere in here, that's about where we're going to be. And that's probably what we'll continue to be on that. Probably the number that has the greatest impact, at least on a lot of the marketing grids, because the discounts and things are going to be numbers of yield grade fours and fives. And so uh, this past year we had 14.5% uh, of them that were in that, and that number kind of goes up and down. One of the people we worked with I thought was interesting, he said, you know, it was like there was, wasn't as much of a discount in fours and fives that, you know, this past year or the year before that, you're just trying to get cattle. You know, so you weren't worried so much about what the discounts be. You had to have cattle. And so then as you have more cattle available, then the grids will reflect that and will start uh, having an impact as far as what will happen on that. Now, these are the last couple slides I have on, on the, or this last slide on the implant part. And this is just showing you the numbers from 2011 to 2016. So you can see the yield grade were 2.9 up to 3.1, fat thickness up a little bit. Carcass weight makes the biggest jump uh, in that. Ribeye area, just this slight increase. But you also see the reflection where the quality grade is at, uh, the marbling score is at small 70 versus small 40. So that's a pretty good uh, size increase. And that probably reflects, again, that 72% of the cattle that are going to grade prime or choice within that. Let me move to the instrument grading assessment. In 2011, it was the first year that we had access to it. We really thank the companies that provided information. They don't have to do this, but they did. And so we worked with, uh, um, one of the nice things about it, I think everybody we worked with were former students of Keith or Viers. So that kind of makes that a nice uh, opportunity to be able to do that. But uh, they shared with a, a week's worth of information per month from their plants, and then we put this all together so it's all merged and so that we're not sharing anybody's information um, uh, within that. But when you look at the power of this, we have 4.5 million carcass, uh, carcasses to be able to analyze in that. And so that's, a, you know, that's the largest database probably that, that is accessible and can be published now and be available for everybody. So we really appreciate um, all the, the people that have worked with us to get that information. And again, all that's like in an Excel spreadsheet. That wouldn't have happened years ago. And so the fact that you can do that and be able to analyze that, that looks good. Here's kind of the grading, um, Carx's grading choice by month. And again, uh, they're ranging anywhere from kind of the 69 to 71, uh, 72%. 
you know, you could probably overlay, if you're uh, wanting to look at more information, you could probably look at some choice select spreads over that time and some other kind of conditions and just kind of look at that. But I thought that was kind of interesting to look at least some seasonal. In the 2011 audit, we didn't have monthly. We had like every other month. So this is the first time we really had monthly data we could share. So that's really nice from that standpoint. This also shows the... Uh, differences between what we had from the instrument assessment versus the in-plant assessment we did for the uh, commodity choice and the top choice, and the top choice would be those programs like certified Angus beef, usually modest marbling or above, and the prime. And so you can see that in the comparison on that. These are the comparisons that we uh, had between the 2011 data versus the 2016. So you can see again the yield grade uh, 2.9 versus the 3.1. The 3.1 matches exactly with the um, in-plant data. Uh, fat thickness 0.47 to 0.54. Carcass weight again up uh, from that and then the ribeye area. And then you can see again uh, increase in the marbling score. I love this slide. You know, as an educator, you're always wanting good information you can use to support whatever you've been teaching with. And for years, and those of you who are former students in here, if you can remember any of that, we always talk about dark cutting. We always said, well, dark cutting, at least in Texas, tends to be primarily in October is where we get the largest increase because that's when we start getting the weather changes. And it's weather changes that probably drive more of this than whether it's consistently hot or consistently cold. And so we, for the first time, have good year-long data that shows that October is the correct date on that. This will now be in my teaching materials on that. The other one that I probably have received over time has been the fact that we'll get calls from the panhandle and it'll be, Oct or it'll be August and say, hey, we're getting a lot of dark cutters in August. And if you notice, other than that September, October, the next kind of that higher deal is during our uh, hot time. So, you know, we don't always have to have cold stress that can cause dark, cur dark cutters. We can have some heat stress that'll do the same thing there, and so we have that there. But uh, this is just a great set of data to be able to do. The other thing I want to tell you about this, these numbers are relatively low, though. So that's good news. We've got fewer dark cutters. Now, for them to be a dark cutter, probably on the camera, they've got to be a pretty severe dark cutter. But even on the implant, when we call dark cutters, we didn't have near as, uh, near as many, or, uh, or their uh, severity wasn't quite as high. And I think that's probably a reflection, too. You can't control the weather. We know that. But we can control handling. We can control, and the amount of the, the better handling Cattle being handled better today than maybe at any point in, in um, the history of cattle handling. And I think about the way that they're being transported, offloaded, handling at the plant. You think about all the educational efforts that have been going on to make sure that, that uh, cattle are handled the, way, the best way they can be. And so I think that's, we're seeing some good reflection of some of that show up in the data. And I think everybody's been congratulated for the work that they're doing. When you're looking at, uh, again, some other kinds of, of uh, implant versus instrument assessment, you see here that, uh, again, the differences between the two for prime and for choice and for select, and then the others are going to be the hard bone, they're going to be the uh, standard type, uh, over 30 months of age, any of those that kind of fit into there. Look at yield grade, and virtually they're uh, the same for yield grade ones and fives. Slight differences, but again, they're very, very close and lined up very well. And then I think the bottom line here when you look at this, and I think a celebration of the accuracy of both systems, the ability of the instrument to be able to predict the implant, and the ability of the implant to predict the instrument. Look at this information here. So you got 9,000 carcasses with the yield grade 3.1. You have 4.5 million carcasses, yield grade 3.1. You look at fat thickness, two hundredths of a unit difference. You look at carcass weight, about seven pounds. You look at ribeye, one-tenth. But look at this number right here. Look at the marbling score. You have small 70 and you have small 75. Now, anybody that's ever called marbling, if we had everybody in here that's ever done that on a judging team or, you know, whatever it is, and we brought in some carcasses and lined them up here and had everybody call it, we couldn't be within a degree of marbling, much less 
you know, five hundredths of a unit like that. And I think this is great news for the beef industry and the ability to have these systems check independently, third party. So if you're selling beef in whatever system you're selling, and if you're selling on a grid, the confidence that you know that these numbers are correct, that these numbers are accurate to each other, I think that's great information. So what's the bottom line when we take a look at all this? Well, there's numerical increases in yield grades. Probably knew that. But on the good side, we're getting uh, higher grading carcasses. Fat thickness up a little bit. Obviously, hot carcass weight continues to go up. Slight increases in ribeye area. Marbling scores up. We did see that increase in dairy type carcasses in these plants. And then, of course, in prime, and then with yield grade fours and fives. We have some great things going on, some things we need to work on, but I think that's always the highlight of the audit, is finding what's, what people are doing well, and then what are some of the things that need to work on uh, from that standpoint. So um, I'm at the end of this. Deb, you want to come up? Thank you, guys.